Um, so my name is Jared Simpson. I'm a fellow at the OICR. I've only been in Toronto for a few months. I came here uh, from the Sanger Institute in Cambridge where I was doing a PhD. Uh, I'm a computational biologist. I work mainly on developing sequence analysis software and sequence analysis algorithms, uh, which is all going to be relevant to what we're going to talk about today. Um, the main research question that I work on is de novo assembly, which is where you take a set of sequence reads and then you try to reconstruct the genome without any other information. Um, I'm not going to talk about assembly today. I'm going to talk more about how to do sequence analysis based on a reference genome, but if you have any questions about de novo assembly or anything else that's not covered here today, uh, feel free to ask me in a break or my email's at the end of uh, the slides here. So the focus of this module is going to be on mapping sequence reads to a reference genome, um, also known as alignment um, of sequence reads. And then in the second part of this module, I'll be talking about how to find genome rearrangements based on sequence read alignments. Um, so I'm going to split this up into two parts. I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes on the problem of mapping reads to a reference genome. And then we'll do an exercise where you get to uh, use a mapper yourself and work with some sequencing data. And then we'll have a coffee break. And then I'll talk about genome rearrangements. And then we'll have another lab um, where you can run a rearrangement finder on some uh, real sequence data. So here's what I hope you get out of this module of the course. Um, so first and foremost, I think the most important, or the, the, the first step of almost all sequence analysis is finding out where in the reference genome a sequence read came from. And I want to give you a good understanding of how we find that out by mapping sequence reads to the reference genome. So understanding this process and then understanding the file formats that you work with when you work with aligned data is really the primary goal of this part of the workshop. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is standard file formats that sequence reads come in, which is called the FASTA format and FASTQ format, and then the standard uh, file format that mapped data is represented by, which is called the SAM and BAM format. I'll talk about some common terminology that you hear used to describe alignments, things like uh, mapping quality, paired end reads, and how those are all used in downstream sequence analysis. And I'll particularly talk about how paired end reads can be used to find genome rearrangements. Things like translocations where, say, uh, two arms of two different chromosomes are swapped, or large deletions or inversions, these sort of large structural changes to chromosomes. And in the labs, you'll be able to run um, a mapper and a rearrangement caller uh, on your own. And please, as I go through, if, if anything isn't clear, just ask questions and, and be informal and, and shout if I'm going too fast or too slow. Um, right, so yesterday, I think John McPherson talked in depth about the different sequencing platforms that are available. Just to reiterate um, this, there's a wide range of instruments available. Some will give you very long reads, like the PAC Bio instrument will can sequence 5 kb uh, reads at a time with a higher error rate. The throughput on PAC Bio is quite a bit lower. And then as we go up the scale of throughput, um, you get up to the Illumina High Seq machine, which can output hundreds of gigabases per run, but the reads are only about 100 bases long. And now it's common to run multiple different sequencing technologies on one project. And integrating all of that data is a big problem. And the way that we do this now is we map all the data to a reference genome and then work with the aligned data um, to call, say, mutations in a cancer or structural changes or anything. So this step of aligning data to the reference genome is really a fundamental step um, that starts off sequence analysis. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Now, I'm not going to talk so much about PacBio or ion torrents, but I'm going to be focusing mostly on Illumina data uh, in this module, as that's the predominant sequencing technology, and it's most likely what most of you would be working with. Um, now, the very first step um, in the sequencing process is translating what the instrument measures, which for the Illumina sequencer is taking pictures of fluorescently labeled DNA molecules 
and translating those pictures into the actual sequence reads. And this process is called base calling. So here's what raw Lumina data looks like. You have uh, an image of a microscope slide where each one of these dots is an individual cluster of DNA molecules. Um, each cluster is fluorescently labeled and with the color of the cluster giving um, one of the nucleotides within the read. So all of these dots are an individual read for a particular cycle within the sequencing process. And now the important thing to understand at this point is that this process of going from these images to base calls isn't perfect. The instrument can make errors. For instance, if these clusters are too close together, it might mix up what color each of, uh, each of the reads are at a particular position, and it might give an incorrect base call. So the sequencing process is inherently noisy, and we can have sequencing errors within our bases. And this informs all the downstream analysis, and it needs to account for the fact that these sequence reads aren't perfect. We always have sequencing errors uh, within our data. Now, as a concrete example of that, we can look at how one source of error in Illumina data. So, as I said, these uh, Illumina is imaging a cluster of molecules, so it's not a single molecule process. What it's doing is looking at a group of a few thousand identical DNA molecules at once. And it's elongating the strand, of, um, each strand of these DNA molecules one step at a time. And usually all of the DNA molecules in that cluster are on the same position at once. So if we're in this example, we've had uh, six sequencing cycles. So we've read off these six bases and we're going to the next one. And you'd expect most of the DNA molecules within that cluster to be on the same cycle. But occasionally, because if a base isn't incorporated, some of these uh, molecules will lag behind. So this one's only on the fourth cycle. And this one's on the eighth. It's gone ahead. And it's called a phasing problem or pre-phasing problems where some of the, the molecules in the cluster lag behind or have jumped ahead. And this makes the signal, when it's trying to read off the color for this particular base, noisy because these ones are all gray, but this one's red, and this one's blue. So that adds some noise to the process, and this is one of the sources of errors in Illumina data. So because the data is noisy, we want to be able to quantify how trustworthy our data is. And we do that by what's called quality scores. Um, so quality score is given for each base in a read. So if you have 100 base reads, you have 100 different quality scores. And this is the sequencing instrument's uh, estimation of how trustworthy the base is. So with the log scale, the probability that the base call at that position is incorrect. And so it's called the FRED quality scores. It's a scale from uh, 0 to 40, 40 being the most trustworthy bases. Um, a base quality of 40 means that there is about a 1 in 10,000 chance that that base is incorrect. A FRED score of 10 is about a 10% chance of that base call is incorrect. So as you can imagine, if you're trying to find mutations in cancer and you see what could be a mutation, but it only has a, a quality score of 10, you might not trust that as much as if you saw a mutation in a read and it had a quality score of 40. And all the downstream sequence analysis uh, software that does things like finding mutations takes these quality scores into account when it's trying to call whether there's been a change at a particular uh, base in the reference data. Now, one thing I will discuss about different sequencing technologies is they all have different error profiles. They all have different chemistry, they're all uh, different sequencing strategies, and those differences in chemistry give you different types of errors and different error rates within the sequencing uh, data. So the Illumina sequencer has the lowest error rate right now. It's about 1 in 200 bases will be incorrect. Mainly, it's substitution bases. So if the true base is a G there, the instrument might say it's a C, so that would be a substitution error. For the 454 and ion torrent data, um, it's mainly incorrectly inserted or deleted bases, especially in homopolymer runs. Um, so the way that the ion torrent sequencing data works is that um, 
if there's 10 A's in a sequence read, it might say that there is nine A's there, or it might say that there's 11 A's there. So it has problems sequencing through these polynucleotide tracks. And then the other uh, major sequencing technology, the Pacific Biosciences, it has a much higher error rate. Um, typically over 10% to 15%. It makes the data somewhat tricky to work with, um, but it, it's not really a biased error model. It's more of a mixture between insertions, deletions, and base substitutions. So for Lumina data, another important thing to understand is that it's not a uniform error rate across the length of the read. The likelihood that the base is identified incorrectly depends on where in the read it is. Um, so this is a profile of the errors within Illumina reads across the read length. So this was 150 base pair read. So we're going on a scale from 0 to 150 on the x-axis. And this is a histogram of the number of times the bases were incorrect at that position of the read. And as you can see, the likelihood that the base is called incorrectly goes up at the end of the read. And this is due to this phasing problem that I showed before, which, where it's more likely that the strands have gotten out of sync as you go along the length of the DNA sequence. Um, right, and so here it's showing two different reads, uh, because this, this is read pair data, which I'll explain in a second. So this is the first half of the DNA fragment, and this is the second half, where they both have about the same error profile. So there's two main file formats that, you're, that raw sequence data come in. There's the FASTA format, which I'm showing here. Um, if, you've, if you've ever looked at reference genome or, or most sequence data comes in this format, it's a pretty simple format. It has lines that are identified the sequence. So the lines that start with this uh, caret symbol are the identifier lines. And here is a read name and then it's followed by the sequence lines afterwards. And now when you're working with sequence pairs, you'll, you'll typically have two of these uh, files, one for one end of the DNA fragment and one for the other end, um, where reads on consecutive lines in the file are, are make up the, the one pair. Now commonly when you work with Lumina data, you'll start with FASTQ files. Here it's really the same as this FASTA file, except we're adding quality information in. So in the FASTQ format, we again have an identifier line. This time it starts with an at symbol, and then we have a sequence line, and then there's another identifier line, starting with a plus, and then the base qualities. So this 0 to 40 Fred scale estimation that, that the particular bases are incorrect. Here it's encoded using symbols uh, in the ASCII character set, but these can be transformed into these 0 to 40 likelihoods that, that the base is incorrect. Okay, so that's what the raw data looks like. Now I'm going to talk about aligning these reads to a reference genome. So the alignment process is really just trying to find where in this reference genome say the reference human genome, which is three billion base pairs long, where in that reference genome each one of these reads came from. So the differences between any two pairs of human chromosomes is about one in a thousand bases. The SNP rate's about one in a thousand. Um, so you'd expect most reads, if we just sequenced anyone in this room's genome, to match somewhere quite well in the reference genome. So the alignment process is just taking the reads from one individual and mapping them onto this reference genome to, to see where we think that that read came from. Um, now there's a couple computational issues that we have to get over. Um, first is that the human genome is very large and it's very repetitive. Um, about 50% of the human genome is annotated as being uh, part of a repeat, things like retrotransposons. The alu elements are uh, present one million times in the reference genome, they're all quite similar to each other. So we need to be able to very specifically place reads back on the reference genome, taking into account the fact that the genome is very repetitive itself. Um, this is very important to get the alignments correct, because if we misalign a read to the reference genome, if we put it in the wrong place, we might call <coughs> variants that aren't actually uh, true mutations. 
So we have to be very careful when we're mapping these reads back to the reference genome. Of course, these sequencing instruments like the Illumina sequencer produces a huge amount of data. Um, typical sequence run gives you about 600 gigabases of data. To go through this and align it to the reference genome, the software that we use has to be very efficient. We couldn't use something like BLAST, which people have been using to align data to a reference genome for the last, uh, say, 20 years, because it's just too slow. We need software that can process millions or tens of million reads per minute to be able to do this. Um, luckily, this is a huge research question in sequence analysis, um, and there's hundreds of different map uh, mappers or alignment programs to choose from, and they're all designed for the specific problem of mapping these short 100 base pair reads to the reference genome, and they're all quite quick. Um, and of course, the genome that we sequenced, the individual um, whose DNA was extracted and put on the sequencers, isn't going to exactly match the reference genome. They're going to have SNPs that differ from the reference genome. They're going to have indels and structural variation. And also, there's going to be sequencing errors within the reads. So the, the alignment program has to be tolerant of mismatches to the reference and still be able to do a good job of finding the correct position in the reference in the face of the fact that the sequence reads are going to have differences with the reference sequence. So with all that in mind, how do we choose an aligner? Um, as I said, we need to be very accurate about where we place the reads in the reference genome. Um, Any times that we place a read incorrectly, it's likely that it will it'll lead to false positive variant calls. Um, which we'd like to minimize. It needs to be very sensitive. Um, it needs to tolerate these differences between the reference genome and, and the sequence reads because we want to be able to find SNPs and we want to be able to find indels. So the aligner has to do a good job of accounting for the fact that there's true differences between the sequence reads and the reference genome. And as I said, high sp the, the program needs to be very efficient because it needs to map millions or billions of reads to the reference genome. And it's becoming uh, that the informatics cost, the cost of running the computers to map all of your data to the reference genome, is one of the highest costs when you do a sequencing project. Sequencing, the cost of actual performing the act of sequencing is so low now that we have to quite seriously think about how much the computational side of experiments um, are taking. And that's why you want to choose an aligner that can, that's very efficient and can al align a lot of reads to the reference genome. So for this, we're going to use, in the tutorial, we're going to use the very popular aligner called BWA. Um, that stands for Burroughs Wheeler Aligner. That's the type of data structure that it uses. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of how BWA works. I'm happy uh, to answer any questions about that um, in the break. But um, this is a very... This is a very popular mapper to use. It's used, I'd say, in, in most sequencing projects, use this program, BWA, to align their reads to a reference genome. You might have heard about the Thousand Genomes Project, um, which is a big population sequencing project that was um, started by many groups around the world. Uh, it's led by Richard Durbin at the Sanger Institute. Um, they designed, Richard Durbin's group designed this program, BWA, and it's used in the Thousand Genomes uh, Project and a lot of the other <laughs> sequencing projects like ICGC. Um, now, of course, BWA is not the only mapper out there. Um, there's hundreds of mappers that have been published. Uh, I'll, I've just left this slide in as a very good review paper for the different choices that you have of mappers. So if you're interested, you can read this paper. It'll talk about things like the speed of each one of these programs, how sensitive they are to various levels of differences, and how accurate each one of these aligners are. So if you uh, are interested in trying out a different program, you can read this and, and hopefully inform your choice of what alignment software to use. It also covers a lot of these different issues that I'm talking about, like accuracy and sensitivity in more detail. So this would be a good resource to read uh, if you're interested in the mapping process. OK, so going back to uh, aligning an individual sequence read to the reference genome. So this is sort of just a picture of the process. We have a sequence read here shown in red. We have a reference genome in black at the top. And we need to pick where in this reference genome this read came from. So how do we do that? Well, we just compare this read 
to all these different places in the reference genome and see which one uh, is the most likely. So say we've done this, um, and, and this position here, so let's say we have three candidate alignment positions, one that doesn't have any mismatches to the reference, one that has a single mismatch, and one that has two mismatches to the reference. Well, at this point, we don't know if these mismatches are sequencing errors, and we don't know if there are true differences between the uh, read and the reference. It might be a SNP. So just like how we used base quality to quantify the uncertainty of whether an individual base in the sequencing read is correct or not, we have an equivalent measure which is called alignment quality. Or you might have heard, of, heard it referred to as mapping quality. And this is the alignment program's estimation that the place that it's chosen in the reference genome is correct. So again, it's just a Fred scale estimate of the probability that the chosen mapping on the reference genome is incorrect. So for instance, if, it, if the aligner says that the mapping is Q30, one in a thousand reads with a Q30 alignment will be placed incorrectly in the reference. And this is important to know, we need to know whether our alignments themselves are trustworthy or not when we're trying to find uh, mutations between an individual and the reference genome. So if you find a mutation and the aligner says that they're all Q3, you're probably not going to trust those alignments and you would probably say that that, that mutation isn't, uh, isn't true. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about paired end reads. I alluded to this earlier. Yep. Is there a possibility to find multiple word mapping on the reference genome, or it's only one? Right, so that's a good question. So different programs will do different things. So for BWA, it will output one alignment. It will try to pick the best one, the most likely source of that read in the reference genome. And then it will estimate the quality using this mapping quality. For other programs, they might give you all possible places it's from, or all plausible places that the read's from. We generally refer to those as multi-mappers. So you might hear this term, this is a multi-mapper. And it, when it writes out this alignment format, you'll have five hits, 10 hits to the reference genome. And hopefully it will call, um, calculate mapping quality for each one. For some applications, things like let's say chip seek, you might want to know all the possible mapping locations. For other things like variant calling, you might just be interested in the, in the best one. So it's, it, it's, it's again a choice of how, how the software was designed, but it's an important thing to understand. That, that Q score, then, is that just an estimate of how many other hits there are in the genome? Yeah, that's right. It's yeah, it, it, it's essentially uh, how many other hits. Like it, you can, let's go back to this example in a bit more detail. So here, um, for this mapping position to be the true one, you don't need to account for any differences between the read and the reference genome. For this to be the true mapping location, you need to account for this. So if say the base quality of this mismatch was very low, say it was Q3, it might be that those are equivalent mapping locations and the aligner can't really decide between them. Um, so when the mapping score is calculated, it's taking into account how many different uh, mismatches there are to the, the different candidate alignment positions, what the base qualities of those candidate alignment positions are, and then it'll generally run a probabilistic model to calculate the Q score. So it's using the Fred score as well? It's using the Fred score when it's deciding which the best place is going. So if the sequence reads were to map to only the, the few spots it maps to the higher the quality score? Yes, that's right. So in the worst case, if you have two exact alignments, say the read has no sequencing errors, and it, there's two positions in the reference genome where it maps without mismatches, the aligner can't decide between these two. And then it would give it a Q quality score of zero. It would say, it's completely ambiguous. There's two equivalent mapping locations. I'm, I'm not going to try to decide between these two because I don't have any information to go on. So if it, it would just assign the reads and map to these repeats as Q0. So this is an important quality score. That's when you really don't want to trust the read. Like almost no variant calling programs would look at Q0 reads and trust them as being placed correctly. Yeah. Does the mapping quality decrease as you increase the number of multi-mappers? 
Even though each map quality will be different depending on the base qualities and all of the possible sites for the Yeah. Do you, is there a penalty for mapping qualities basically relative to the number of mapping sites? Yeah, as you have more candidate mapping locations, the mapping quality is going to decrease for say the best right. possible one. The ways that it the way that the programs usually work is that it, it can't exhaustively find every possible mapping location, so it has a heuristic where it will calculate the number of, um, estimate the number of possible mapping locations and calculate the quality based on that. That's at least how BWA works. Um, for the, these programs, these multi-mappers that try to exhaustively place the read everywhere, they could make a more refined estimate of what the true one is. But yeah, in, in the general point that the more candidate alignment sites there are, the more the lower the mapping quality be. That's right. <coughs> and these sort of issues, like when the Illumina sequencers first came out, the reads were only 36 base pairs long. Actually, the very first iterations were about 27 base pairs long. But in, in the, the first production Illumina, the reads were around 36 base pairs long. And at that length scale, the human genome is very, very repetitive. And being able to say whether a read is placed correctly on the reference genome is very important. Um, so when you have 36 base pair reads, you'd have a lot of these Q0 alignments that you just can't trust. So a way around this, or a way around um, the uncertainty of being able to place reads on the reference genome is to take paired end reads. And here, we take a fragment of DNA, and in standard Illumina sequencing, you sequence from this end about 100 bases in. And that's one read. In, in paired end sequencing, you sequence one end of the DNA, and then you sequence the other end of the DNA as well. So here you'd have 100 base pair reads from either side. And if this DNA fragment is 400 bases, you'd have 200 bases of sequence in the middle that you don't know anything about. So you have a read, and then an unknown stretch of bases, and then another read. And this allows you to map to the reference genome with much higher accuracy. So let's go back to this cartoon of mapping. Um, here we have a sequence read pair, and we want to find where it is on the reference genome. So here, in this alignment location, we have one half of the read that matches perfectly, one half of the read that matches with one mismatch. And this candidate location, there's a mismatch in the first half of the read, and then tons of mismatches on this half of the read. So this the left alignment is much more likely to be the true alignment in this case. And we're able to refine these alignment locations because we have much more information here. Not only have we doubled the read, the amount of bases in our read from 100 to 200, but because there's this stretch of DNA in the middle, um, we're able to map around repetitive elements much better. So the standard, the size of these ALU repeats, which are one of the most prevalent repeats in the human genome, are about 300 bases long. So if you have paired end reads of 400 bases, you're likely to have one half of the read map in unique sequence. And that allows you to anchor the read uniquely in the reference sequence. So when we're working with paired end data, instead of having, say, 80% of our reads mapped uniquely to the reference genome, if we have paired end data, we can have about 95% of the reads mapped uniquely to the reference genome. And we'll have power to call variants in all of these different locations. And the mapper, of course, takes into account um, both ends of the pair when it calculates mapping quality. So you'll see a lot of paired end data that have mapping quality of 40 or 50 or 60, very, very likely that the reads are placed correctly on the reference genome. Okay, so now I'm going to give an overview um, of the SAM and BAM format. So this was developed um, at, I'd say, the start of, of the next generation sequencing era when we were all starting to work with large amounts of alignment data and there's a big push to standardize the way we represent alignments so that we, every program that wanted to work with alignment data didn't implement its own file format. We just had one file format and then everybody worked off this specification. So it stands for the SAM, stands for Sequence Alignment Mapping, um, and it's a tab delimited text representation of uh, the alignment data and what that means 
is that you can just read it with a program like Notepad or, or any Unix tools like Less or Cat or anything. BAM is binary alignment, and this is a binary representation, um, <clears throat> which means it's encoded to minimize the amount of space it takes on the disk. Um, and you can read it in, in standard programs. You need to, to run a program to output, um, output the, the alignments in SAM. So this is what the SAM format looks like. Um, so there's uh, um, some rows, of, uh, some columns of information, which I'll get to on the next slides, and then you have your sequence read, and then its quality scores, again encoded as uh, ASCII characters in this FRED 40 format. So I'll go through each one of these uh, fields in detail now. So the first field in SAM is the read name. So that was that first identifying line on the FASTQ format from your FASTA formats that uniquely identifies each one of the reads. And then you have this special flag field. So this is a bit masked um, value that encodes things like whether the read maps to the, the forward strand of the reference or whether it had to be reverse complemented to map to the reference because the DNA, uh, the sequencers can read either strand of the DNA. So you need to be able to account for the fact that, that either strand was read when mapping the reads back to the reference, whether it was reverse complemented is encoded in this flag. Um, it would also encode information like if this read has a pair somewhere else in the file and if both pairs are mapped to the same chromosome and, and a few other things that are more uh, technical about how the mapping process was done. Moving along, the next field is the reference chromosome that it was mapped to and the reference coordinate. So this is the coordinate which is the start of the read, uh, where the start of the read was mapped. So it was, this base was mapped to this position in the reference. Moving along, this is the mapping quality. So here the mappers found a very confident alignment for this read. It was mapped with a Q60, which I think is something like um, one in a million chance that it was mapped incorrectly, so it's a very trustworthy alignment. Next is what's called the cigar string. So this uh, encoding tells you how the bases between the reference genome and the read line up. Um, so I don't know if everybody can see this down here, but this is just a toy example. So if we have a reference sequence here and our read sequence here, to align the read to the reference, we had to delete this T. So the cigar string in this case would be 4M, which encodes that there was four matches between the reference and the read, these four, and then 1D, one deletion, and then 6M, six more matches. So using just this compact representation, it tells you how the bases within the read line up with the bases on the reference genome. And then there's different cigar operations for the different ways you can align it. In this case, there was a T inserted into the read. So here we have 4M, again, four matches, then one I, one base inserted, and then 4M, four more matches. Do you have a tag on there? Sorry? Have you seen the reference in the read, the G, Ah, yes, good. I, I put this in on purpose, and then I thought I should talk about it. So, the, the M's don't tell you whether the same base is in the reference and uh, the read. They don't give you mismatch information. So it's only that the base is, that this, they're aligned at the same position, not whether they're, they're the same nucleotide. So that's important to know because it's a common thing. Where if you say you wanted to calculate how many errors are in your reads, you can't just look at the cigar format. There's another tag which is similar that gives you whether the bases are incorrect in a particular position or not. Okay, and then after the cigar string, um, if you have paired end data, it tells you where on the reference genome the read pair was aligned to. So in this case, the mappers would be assigned there. That means it's the same chromosome. So it's chromosome 19 and chromosome 19. And then it tells you the position of the start 
of the mate on the reference, and then the insert size. And the insert size is the length of the DNA fragment from here to here. So usually we have a 100 base read and some distance in between where we don't know the sequence, and then another 100 base pair read. This insert size tells you this total distance between the two. And that's important for structural variation calling because later on we're going to look for deviations between the expected insert size and what the mapper found as a way of finding deletions and insertions. Is there an indication for which version this is in line to? Yes. Or is that in a header file? It is in a, it is in a header. So I didn't talk about the SAM headers, but um, in, the, in the tutorial it talks about the SAM headers and you can look at them. And essentially, it's before all the alignments, all the lines that start with at symbols, that's the header of the SAM file. And then within there, there's a series of tags. And within those tags, most mappers will tell you the, the version of the reference that the, uh, the reads were mapped to. Um, I'll show this next slide. So this link here, samtools.sourceforge.net slash sam, that's the specification for this file format. Within that spec, it will tell you what each one of these tags that are found in the header mean. So if you ever need to look up information about the SAM format, you want to look at this file, and then you can see, okay, the VM tag is uh, the version of the reference, things like this. Um, so the, most, the common way of working with these SAM BAM files is to use this package called SAM tools. Uh, this is written by Hang Lee. What it, it can do a lot of different things. Mainly you can convert between this text SAM format and this binary BAM format. You can also sort the alignments by position on the reference genomes or extract alignments for just the small subregion of the reference that you're interested in. Um, I just told you about the specification. If you have any questions or, or need help with these, there's a lot of good resources. Uh, there's a mailing list for SAM tools where you can just post a question about any of these things, like if you say, want to know uh, how to find out what version the reference is, you could post that question here and someone will quickly get back to you. And then there's these two more general uh, web forums that people post questions to, one called Biostars, which is like a Stack Overflow uh, type question and answer site, and then there's a web forum called Seek Answers, uh, where there's a lot of helpful users where people post questions and can get help on uh, any of their uh, anything that they need help for related to sequencing. Okay, so uh, now we'll go through the exercise, the first one on read mapping. Um, so I guess first you'll want to log into your cloud instances um, and we can help with that if anybody needs. Um, okay, so the first part was just working with alignment data, getting reads mapped to your reference genome. And then a natural next step is trying to understand the ways in which the thing that we've sequenced differs from the reference genome. Um, there are different types of variation from small single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are just single base changes, to short indels, where some amount of sequence from one base pair to a few hundred base pairs has been inserted or deleted. Um, and then there's much larger changes, which we generally call structural changes or genome rearrangements. Certain to the different classes of these can be large insertions, so a kilobase of sequence inserted uh, into the genome or deleted, whole genome segments inverted, um, translocations, so bits of sequence swapped between different chromosomes, and that can be copy number variation as well, where entire blocks have been duplicated either within a local region or there are two different copies elsewhere in the genome. So I'm going to talk about different ways to find these larger structural changes using paired end data. Um, I think tomorrow Sarab is going to talk about finding shorter mutations, SNPs, substitutions in cancer, um, short indels, and also copy number variation. So we all start from the same place which is these BAM files that we just generated um, in, this, in, in the first part of this uh, module. And then all of that is the input into these, these downstream tools, which will catalog the type of variation present. Right, so 
standard way of finding structural variation, these larger changes, is using this paired end data that I introduced in the first part of the lab. So there's two different ways of finding, of sequencing read pairs. Um, there's fragmentation based, which is the standard way of doing it on, on Illumina. What you do is you take some genomic DNA, shear it into pieces that are about 200 to 500 bases in length, and then you sequence the ends of these fragments. So here, the yellow part, for sequencing adapters, and we sequence from these adapters inwards, getting these paired end reads that we worked with in the first part of, um, of the lab. This is a fairly straightforward way, and this is the standard way of doing Illumina paired end sequencing. But you can, you're limited by the size of fragment that you can do with this protocol. You can only really do 500, maybe 600 base pair fragments um, in, in, in paired end sequencing. This doesn't give you really long range information. If you want longer range information, tens of, kilo, tens of kilobases, you can use mate pair sequencing. And how this works is that, again, we take genomic DNA, shear it, but we select for much larger uh, fragment sizes, multiple kilobases, so say 1 to 20 kb pieces, and uh, we make a circle from these bits of DNA, and then we cut the circle and sequence from the pieces that were cut in the circle. So instead of sequencing this 5 kb piece of DNA, we make a circle out of it, and then we can sequence this part on the Lumina sequencing just like before. And here, when we map the reads that have come from this part of this, this circle of DNA, they'll map very far apart on the reference genome. And this is useful for finding very large structural variation. Um, when I work with the genome assemblies, you, it's critical to have this really long and in, long range information to get over repetitive elements of the reference genome. So this is a really common thing to do for genome assembly or for structural variation finding. Um, but most data is the shorter range 500 base pair paired end protocol. Now what I didn't talk about um, much in the first part is the orientation of these read pairs. Now DNA is a double-stranded molecule and sequencing always proceeds from the five prime end of DNA to the three prime end. And when we sequence a read pair, this, so this is the five prime end, we sequence the upper strand of DNA in this direction, and then we sequence five prime, three prime, this uh, end of the DNA, and we've sequenced the lower strand. Now what this means is that when we map the reference gene, these reads to the reference genome, we have to take into account the expected orientation of these read pairs. And the expected orientation is that one end of the pair is going to map to the forward strand of the reference, and then one end of the pair is going to map to the reverse strand of the reference. So they're from different strands, so we expect one of each. Now this is critical for structural variation finding to understand this sort of, that there's an expected orientation of this, of these uh, read pairs. So is that clear to everybody that the, the reverse complement, we're expecting one to be reverse complemented, one to be uh, just normal. Now, second thing that we need to understand to find structural variation is that when we sequence read pairs, we don't always have exactly 400 base pair fragments or exactly 500 base pair fragments. They follow a distribution of insert sizes. So you, the usual way of doing size selection of, fine, of um, making these libraries for DNA sequencing is that you we'll run the DNA on a gel and then cut out a band of, of the gel and then everything within a range gets sequenced. So you're not, you don't have exactly 400 base pairs fragments, but you might have some that are 400 base pairs, some that are 401, some that are 450 base pair fragments, but we can calculate the expected distribution of fragment sizes. So instead of having exact things, we have sort of, um, it's, it, it, they can, it's sampled from a distribution. And we can use this information of what would the expected size of these DNA fragments are to find things like insertions and, or deletions. Now, when BWA maps paired end data to a reference genome, it classifies pairs as being concordant and discordant. 
Now, a concordant pair are pairs that match the reference genome with the expected orientation. So one pair on the forward strand, one pair on the reverse strand, and also it's within the expected distance. So BWA, if going to this example, if say this is 380 bases and this is 420 bases, any pair that maps within that range is within the expected distance of the paired end library. Anything that maps outside of that range is outside of the expected distance. And the pairs that are either mapped in without the expected orientation or without the expected distance are called discordant. And it's these discordant read pairs that give evidence of structural variation. So we'll be looking at these read pairs and seeing what they tell us about uh, the, the genomes. So here I'm, I'm just going to show some slides that show different situations of structural variation. So in the, uh, the top line is what we'll call the donor genome. This is what you've sequenced. And the bottom one is ref. This is the reference genome. So in this case, what I'm showing is a deletion. So the reference genome has this red block that isn't present in the donor genome. That red block was deleted in this individual. And I've just shown it by dashed lines to show um, that that sequence isn't present, with these red bars being the breakpoints of this deletion. Now, when we go to sequence with a read pair, when we sequence the donor, we have a pair that looks like this. This might be 400 base pairs long. When we map that pair to the reference, because we need to accommodate for this red block, it's not in the donor, the pairs map much further away from each other than you'd expect. The, the aligner, say BWA, had to put these pairs 600 bases away instead of the expected 400 bases. So in this case, this would be a discordant read pair, and we could use this to try to find this deletion. So what you do is you take your BAM file and you run a program that looks for clusters of pairs, clusters of discordant pairs, that are consistently mapped further away from each other than you expect. And that's the, solution, uh, that's the signature for deletion, where this insert size flag, this insert size field in the BAM file is much larger than expected. Now the opposite of that is a signature of an, an insertion. So in this case, now this red block is only present in the donor, but not the reference. So here, when we sequence it, again, if this pair is 400 bases, for BWA to align this pair to the reference genome, it had to put them much closer together than expected. So here, they might only be 200 bases along, uh, apart. And in this case, what we can do is go through our BAM file and look for read pairs um, where they're consistently mapped smaller than expected. So that's a the signature for an insertion. Now, of course, we can have much more complex changes. Um, here's what it looks like if a piece of this donor genome was duplicated in tandem. So we have this blue arrow, which has two copies in the donor. If we have a pair spanning these two copies, where the reference only has one copy, this read is going to map here. This read gets mapped here in the wrong orientation. So in this case, we have a signature where the insert size might not look abnormal, but both reads, the reads are mapped in the wrong orientation. This one might be mapped to the forward strand, this one might be mapped to the reverse strand, but they're pointing away from each other instead of pointing towards each other like you expect. So this is a signature of a tandem, tandem duplication. Likewise, if a section of the genome was inverted, so here, again, we have a blue segment of the donor genome where I flipped it. So I just go head to tail here in the reference genome. We have pair mapping from here to the blue, to the tail of this blue in the donor. This maps here, but this one maps all the way over here. Again, in the wrong orientation. So this would be a signature of, um, of an inversion. Now, when you're working with paired in data, there's sort of a shorthand for discussing the orientation of reads. Um, 
Reads that are mapped in the expected orientation are called FR, so for forward reverse. Reads that are mapped like this would be RF, reverse forward. And reads that are mapped like this would be forward forward. So that gives you some, uh, this is just a way of referring to how the different read pairs are, um, are referred to. So if we summarize what the different signatures of structural variations are, um, it looks like this. So an insertion, the distance between the ends is smaller than expected, but the orientations are normal. In a deletion, uh, the distance between the ends is much larger than expected. Again, the orientation is normal. For an inversion, we don't know too much about um, the map distance. They could either be very, very far away if it was a megabase inversion, um, or uh, they could be close together or something more local. But the orientation is this FF signature where both reads are mapped to the forward strand. For 10 duplication, again, we don't know. Uh, we can't say what the map distance will be. Usually, it will be distant, different than expected, but we have this signature where it's the first reader is reversed, and then the next one is forward. Um, I didn't show any signatures of interchromosomal rearrangements, but usually this is quite, um, the signature is quite easy, where one half of the pair maps to one chromosome, the other half of the pair maps to another. Yep? Forward means and Usually, I mean um, the reference strand. So one of them matches the strand of the references in the FASTA file, and then the one that's R was reverse complemented to match the reference. So say the reverse reference strand. Okay, so um, we don't have perfect power to find various structural variations. If these insertions are very long, we might not have um, long enough paired ends to span from one end of the insertion to the other. Um, so if, say this is a 2 kb insertion um, and we only sequenced 500 base pair fragments of DNA, we're not going to have a pair that's here and a pair that's here. We just have pairs that fall in the middle of this insertion. And in this case, we're not going to be able to find that. So we're somewhat limited in the size of insertion that we can find with 500 base pair DNA fragments. This is why you can do mate pair sequencing to get longer things. For deletions, you can find deletions of any size because even if a megabase is deleted, you're still sequencing on either side <coughs> of the breakpoint with a 500 base pair uh, fragment. So that this type of structural variation analysis is is usually referred to as discordant pairs. There's a different line of evidence for finding structural variation, which are called split reads. So these are reads where we couldn't align the full length of the read to the reference genome. So usually we expect, to, if we have 100 base pair reads, to map that full 100 base pair segment to some part of the reference genome. If a read falls on a breakpoint of one of these structural variations, we might not be able to map the whole length of the read. We might have to either just partially map it or map it in multiple places. And these are called split reads. So here's uh, an example. Of the a split read signature for a deletion. Here, the first read covers this break point, this red line, and the tail of the read maps to this part of the break point here, and then the head of the read maps to this point here. And if your aligner is sensitive enough to long deletions, it might map it like this, where it mapped with a huge gap in the middle. So if you looked at the cigar string for these sort of deletions, it would be something like 50 M, 50 matches, and then 200 base pair deletion, and then another 50 matches. So this is another line of evidence that you can use to look for structural variation. Sometimes what you might do is you could use a discordant pair um, program that will look at discordant pairs to find structural variation, and then you can look for split reads or partially aligned reads around the breakpoint to find the exact location of where uh, this event was. Usually when you're making calls just based on discordant pairs, you don't have a good sense of where the exact break in DNA was. You only will know if it's within a certain range. But if you look at split reads, you can get down to the individual bases that, were, uh, that formed this break point. Okay, so just a few brief words on um, 
particular approaches for cancer sequencing. So when you do a typical cancer, you'll sequence, say, the individual's normal genome, and you'll sequence DNA derived from the tumor, and then you have a couple different strategies for doing the analysis. You can either call structural variation in the normal and structural variation within the tumor independently, and then if you're just interested in the rearrangements that are in the tumor, you can filter out all of the structural variations that you found in the normal to just give you a set of tumor calls. This tends to, um, because you don't have perfect power to find structural variation, you can have a lot of false positives in the tumor if you just didn't make the same call in the normal. So second approach to this is that you find somatic structural variation, so the ones that are in the tumor, and then for each one of these, your somatic structural variations, you can look in the normal reads to see if there's any evidence for those same events. So say you found 1KB deletion in your cancer sample, you can go to the same region, take your BAM file of the normal, and then look for any discordant pairs that show a 1KB deletion there. And that way you can help to filter out anything that has evidence in the germline. Um, and this can lower your false positive rate for structural variation calling. So special case of, of structural variants that are important for cancer um, are gene fusions. So this is where you have two different chromosomes and you might have a translocation between these chromosomes that brings the gene together and creates a fusion protein. Um, now you can find these using the sort of tools that I just discussed. You can find them with, with um, paired end data looking at discordant pairs. But if you do RNA-seq sequencing, which is going to be covered uh, a bit later in the course and John might have talked about it yesterday, you can look for RNA reads that cover this fusion protein breakpoint. So you can look at some reads that map to gene A and some reads that map to gene B. And there are programs, one that was written, I think of the GSC, that's called Defuse. They will take RNA-seq data and look for fusion proteins directly from the RNA. So that's another way of approaching structural variation uh, detection if you're particularly interested in looking at fused genes. Okay, so that was uh, the, the talk part about rearrangements. Is there any questions on those different signatures before I introduce the, uh, the lab? You could look for the same translocations um, and just see if the translocation breakpoints are, say, within exons. And this would be an alternative way of finding fused genes from DNA data. Um, it probably is more common to find gene fusions from RNA. Okay, so I'll introduce you to the second part of the lab. Um, so here we're going to take the BAM file that we produced with BWA in, in, in the first part, and we're going to use a program called Hydra SV, which was written by Aaron Quinlan. Um, to find uh, the rearrangements. So there's multiple rearrangements in the sample that I gave you reads for. Um, and again, you'll just walk through the different steps of running this program uh, to find these rearrangements. So I put the link to the paper up there. It was published in Genome Research a few years ago. I'm using Hydra for this example because it's quite, it's well designed and quite easy to run. There are many, many structure variation callers you might have heard of Breakdown, Sir, or uh, GSA-V, uh, or Pindel. Um, they're all very commonly used programs. Often people will run multiple different structural variation callers and then either merge the results or pick, um, pick ones that look like they have the best sensitivity. So it's worth spending the time to learn multiple different packages um, and learning their strengths and weaknesses. I just put down here that in bioinformatics, it's like a golden rule that there's rarely one program that does absolutely everything perfectly, so it's worth taking the time to learn the strengths and weaknesses of different programs. <laughs>